Hi, everybody. We are going to be talking about toilet training and kind of going over the toilet training protocol. Before I even learned about this, I didn't know there was so much to do with toileting, but we do have a pretty specific toileting protocol and training for you guys. And so I'm going to talk about what we do at the center and kind of what we expect from you guys to do at home. So we're first gonna start with why is toilet training important? Uh, Time and energy, resources, social acceptance and inclusion. Uh, It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money uh, to keep kids in diapers. It's expensive. And as the child gets older, possibly into early elementary adolescence, those diapers get much more expensive and it takes much more time and effort to change them. And of course, we're always leaning towards social acceptance and inclusion. That's what we do here at the center. Where do I start with toilet training? There's a few things we want to look at before we're ready to start toilet training. There's a lot of factors that come into play, especially with our population to decide if they're ready or not. We don't want to start toilet training before they're ready. That can, we're setting ourselves up for failure if we start before a child is ready. So the first thing we want to do is determine readiness. We want to make sure that there's consistency across the environments. We want to make sure they have those toileting routines down. And then we'll talk about the process and materials. With determining readiness, we want to look at their awareness level. Do they know what's going on around them? Do they know what the bathroom is? Are they interested in their peers going to their bathroom, their siblings going to the bathroom? Are they taking notice of that kind of stuff? We want to look at the physiological and other factors. We want to make sure physically they're okay to toilet train. Sometimes there's things like low muscle tone or frequent urinary tract infections. Things like that that could definitely be a barrier to toilet training. And then in order to determine readiness, we're going to start tracking urination and bowel movements to see what that looks like. Awareness level. Do they act differently or seem to notice when their clothing is wet or soiled? Interest or difference in behavior related to the bathroom, toilet, hand washing. Sometimes a lot of our children have difficulty in the bathroom in general. It's loud, it's noisy. So maybe they're willing to go to the bathroom now and they're interested in the faucet. They're interested in how the toilet flushes, things like that. And then interest or change in behavior shown in response to others involved in activities of toileting. One of the ways that we tell a lot at the Pingree Center that a kid's ready, they're really focused on a lot of the reinforcers the other child is get. So like the first praise or the tangible reinforces they take notice to that kind of stuff and so that's something to watch out for physiological factors are they able to remain dry or unsoiled for one to two hours at a time are they dry or unsoiled after they wake up from a nap and do they have regularity in bowel movements regularity in bowel movements is really nice when we're toilet training, a lot of kids are not super regular, but some kids like clockwork 30 minutes after they eat lunch, they have a bowel movement. That's really helpful to toilet training. Are they able to sit and hold their body in an upright position? And then do they have any other medical issues that would prevent toilet training? We talked a little bit about frequent UTIs, low muscle tone. Maybe they're physically not able to sit on the toilet unassisted. Maybe their gross motors behind, things like that. And then other considerations is cooperation with tasks relating to toilet training and the toileting environment. So sound, noise, smells, the toilet's big. When we talk about cooperation with tasks related to toilet training, we're looking at the prerequisite skills. Are they able to pull down pants, pull up pants? Are they able to follow a direction to pull their pants down and to pull their pants up? Are they sensitive to certain noises in the bathroom? So it's really loud. You get an echo in the bathroom, the smell for sure. We have bigger toilets here. We don't have small child-sized toilets. So the toilet can be pretty off-putting to some of our kids because it is big and it flushes and it's loud. So we want to keep that in mind, all those things when we're moving into toilet training. We move on to tracking. So we're, we want to collect some data. If we determine readiness, we have consistency across environments, we have a good toileting routine down, we can kind of move to tracking urination and bowel movements. 
So we are going to check diapers. Once we've determined readiness, we are going to check diapers on a regular schedule and record. And we're probably going to do this a little bit before they're even ready just to see where they're at. We always track often our kids are going to the bathroom, but we're going to be really vigilant when we're looking to toilet training a specific child. We're going to ask you guys to do the same, to track urination and bowel movements at home as well. And we'll give you all of the paperwork and stuff to fill out to do that at home. When we talk about consistency across environments, we want to make sure that you at home are doing the same thing that we're doing at the center. So we want to make sure you guys are ready too. Sometimes the child's ready, but maybe you're expecting a new baby or maybe you're gonna be going on a long vacation or you have family coming in town for three, four weeks. That's probably not the best time to start toilet training. So we wanna make sure that it's good for you guys too, so we can have consistency at home and in the center because consistency is the key to success. Once we decide to move forward with toilet training, before we get a start date, we're gonna meet with the parents or the caregivers, the treatment staff will set up a meeting and they're gonna go over the toilet training process with you guys in detail. Everything I'm talking about now, staff has received the same information and they have kind of a toilet training protocol for every kid. It's pretty much the same across the center. So they're gonna talk to you in detail about the toilet training process because it can be overwhelming. It is a big task to take on, but we will make sure that you guys are ready. Okay, so when we talk about a toileting routine, it's more than just sitting on the toilet. It's everything from the time you walk into the bathroom until you walk out the bathroom. We just want to make sure that they have a good routine in place. So they know they go to the bathroom, they pull down their pants, they sit on the toilet, they go to the bathroom, or they sit for X amount of time. They get up, they wash their hands. So all of those prerequisite skills are in place. We're going to develop a schedule based on the data collected. So we're going to look at the data that we were collecting at the center and you were collecting at home to kind of target those times where they were having um, bowel movements or that they were urinating so we can have more success with toilet training if we can catch them. And then if they are not super regular, so maybe they're not that kid that has a bowel movement 30 minutes after lunch, that makes data much more important to try to figure out when they go. Let's say a child about two o'clock every day is when they usually have a bowel movement. We're definitely going to want to catch them before two o'clock to go to the bathroom. It takes time to get to the bathroom. It takes time to sit on the toilet. So we're going to use that data to get a really good time so they can be successful in the bathroom. Toileting routine, we talked about prerequisite skills before. I'm gonna talk about it again. All these prerequisite and desensitization skills, really you should be working on way before you even think about toilet training. This is something you work on as soon as you're taking a child to the bathroom to wash their hands. The center, when we take children to change their diaper, we're working on all these prerequisite skills. We're trying to get them to be independent and pulling up and down their pants. We're trying to get them to be independent with zippers and snaps, getting them independent with washing their hands, all the things that they need in place in order to be toilet trained. All those prerequisite skills are really important. And then also desensitization. We have a lot of kids who don't even want to go in the bathroom. It's a big barrier for them. It's really loud and it's scary. And so we can work on whatever their sensory issue might be to try to get them desensitized to the bathroom. It might take just getting them to the bathroom for a few minutes at a time and or even a few seconds at a time and then extending them until they feel comfortable in the bathroom. One other thing we do here, I want to just go over it. We do like to do the standing up diaper change. It's really beneficial, especially when you're working on these prerequisite skills. And it's also kind of showing the child that they're not a toddler anymore. They're not an infant anymore. They're a big kid. So we do take them into the stall at the center and we do the stand up diaper change. And that also helps. So they're pulling down their own pants. They're pulling up their own pants or we're prompting them and slowly decreasing those prompts. So we do the stand up uh, diaper change in the center whenever possible. Toileting schedules. 
So we do this a few different ways. So we create a toileting schedule. One way is to create a toileting schedule based on their data, based on when they go. And so we will do it when elimination is most likely to occur. If we have a schedule and it's written and it's in front of the child, it creates predictability. Our children are very routine oriented. And if we write it into their daily routine and we're very consistent at taking them at their scheduled times, it is really helpful. We have less behaviors. They anticipate that they're going to the bathroom. We created our toileting schedule based on data when they eliminate. So this is really, really important as far as um, toilet training is making sure we create a good schedule and then we stick to the schedule. There's different things that we can use as far as visual supports. I am a big fan of visuals all the way around. They're so beneficial for our clients. They help create routine and they assist with prompt reduction and increasing independence. So, for example, you might have a bathroom pets card with a picture of a bathroom on the classroom door. Every time you go to the bathroom, you have the child take the bathroom pets card, then you go to the bathroom. Hopefully, the idea is later on, as they become more independent, they'll go grab that card themselves and you can always pair it with the verbal, I need the toilet. It will definitely increase independence. And if you have those visuals available, they kind of know what to expect. They know where they are, all that stuff. There's visual supports that you could have in the bathroom. I love sequence charts. So of what to do next. So they can kind of look at the sequence. You know, the first step is pull pants down, then sit on the toilet. To start out, you just make sure you're pointing to each step and then you may need to assist your child with the task. But as they get more independent, you can just then point to each step and hopefully the idea is that they will follow each step and then they can move to independence where they may even need that. First, then cards are great. So first the toilet, then a reinforcer. First the wash your hands, then a reinforcer. Here's just some more visuals for you. There's also a lot of social stories that you could get online. I love teachers, paid teachers. They have a lot of free resources for toilet training, a lot of really cute social stories to help with any fears that they might have, social stories that talk the child through routines. You can pretty much find any social story you need online and teachers, paid teacher has tons of free resources. Moving on to dressing for the occasion. Bring in lots of underwear. At first they might be going through lots and lots of underwear. So make sure once we are toilet trading that you send in lots of extra underwear. We'll send home the soiled ones. You can wash them and then send back them clean. Sweatpants without fasteners are really helpful so they can independently pull up and down their own pants. Plastic sandals or Crocs. This is something that I didn't learn about until I got to the center. I wish I knew about this when I was toilet training my own children. It is so helpful when they have an accident to be able just to rinse off their shoes and put them back on. Any plastic shoe that you can just rinse off and put on is going to be wonderful. It's going to be really helpful when they have accidents. Sometimes when a child has accidents and they're wearing tennis shoes, we can't clean the tennis shoes, so they're in socks, and it just doesn't work out too well. So plastic sandals are Crocs. I also find that uh, rain boots are helpful too. Anything we can rinse out. Water shoes are great. And then just bring in extra socks too, just in case we do have to switch those out. And then bring in several changes of clothing and just be in communication with your child's uh, autism specialist and how many clothes they have, what do they need, do they need any extras, that kind of stuff. And then don't send in pull-ups. We're not going to be using pull-ups consistently. We're going to be using them just for transportation. So pull-ups or diapers are going to be used for transportation purposes only. We're not going to use them during the treatment day and we don't want you using them at home either. We only want them for transportation just so they don't urinate in their car seat on the way home. So you're going to send your child to school with a pull-up or diaper under their underwear. The reason for this is when they get to the center, we could just take them to the bathroom and quickly 
pull out their pull up from under their underwear. We don't even need to do a full undress. It's so quick just to pull that diaper out and then they'll be in their underpants ready to go. And the same goes when we're returning the kids at the end of the day, we're gonna put them in a pull up the same way. And when you get home, you can just quickly remove that pull up, the underwear on and they're ready to go. Other considerations, you can use plastic protectors to wear on the outside of underwear. We don't do this that often, but sometimes depending on what's going on, this is really helpful. We might need to use a toilet seat at the center. Sometimes, well, most of the time, it's just one of those inserts that go on top of the regular toilet, just so the hole's not that big. They feel a little bit more secure. They feel like they're not gonna fall in. We do have step stools at the center for the toilet. We have them for the sink as well. It's definitely helpful. I always like to imagine that I'm a little itty bitty four or five year old trying to sit on the toilet. My feet aren't touching the ground. There's this big hole that I might fall in. Step stools are really helpful so they could put their feet firmly on it and then feel a little bit more secure. It's also really helpful with that gross motor or if they have any delays in that, it's helpful too. And then we talk about certain sensory items that might need to be brought to the bathroom with them. Maybe they need head phones. Maybe they need a transition sensory item they play with in their hands, things like that, that might help the transition into the bathroom and all the noises and smells and all the stuff that goes along with it. Reward for successes. I'll read this first and then I'll go over it. One reward that is very motivating to the child and that can be used exclusively for toilet training. It is very important with this reward that it's only used for toileting successes. If the child has free access to it at other times, it could potentially reduce its value and could reduce the child's motivation to use the toilet. And then it might require adjustments with the reward we are using. So we really want to use something that's extremely motivating to the child, their favorite thing, something that they love or something that you think that they're just going to really dig, but we're only going to use it for toilet training. If they have access to that item, at home or during the treatment day is going to make that reward less rewarding. A lot of our children do kind of cycle through what is motivating for them. And so we might need to adjust what we're giving them sometimes a weekly basis, sometimes even a daily basis, but we just need to make sure that it's really, really motivating for them and only used for toilet training. And so we're going to go into the process. Every five minutes, have the child check their pants and ask if they are wet or dry. If the child is dry, praise them for being dry. You can also give them a small tangible reward on a variable schedule. So that means not maybe not every time. You're always going to provide them with tons of verbal praise. A little tangible is really helpful. Maybe just a little skittle or just a tiny little treat. If the child is wet, say in a very neutral tone, you are wet, you need to ask for the bathroom. You just wanna stay really neutral. Your face is gonna be neutral. Your body language is gonna be really neutral. You're not gonna be upset. You're not gonna get frustrated. Just say you are wet, you need to ask for the bathroom. Every 30 minutes, or if we chose a database schedule, so it just depends on what we decide is best for the child, if it's better to kind of use that database schedule or if it's better to take them every 30 minutes. We at the center usually do every 30 minutes, but it varies from child to child. So let's just say every 30 minutes, we're going to take them to the bathroom. We're going to have them sit for three to six minutes to allow time for a success, no longer than six minutes. So just three to six minutes. Make it fun for your child. Make it something that's enjoyable to them. You could sing to them. You could read a book to them. I don't love the iPad, but even an iPad, a little song on an iPad is helpful. Just really try to make it a fun, enjoyable experience for them. And then provide attention and tons of praise for sitting on the toilet, requesting the toilet. Before you take the child to the bathroom on our 30 minute or database schedule, have the child verbalize, use the AAC, so that would be cough drop, or use a picture of a toilet to request for the bathroom. Carrying this will be important in teaching the child how to initiate the need to use the toilet in the future. 
and then consider later in the environment to increase requesting. When we have a child go to the bathroom, we always point to the picture of a toilet and we use the word, do you need to go to the toilet? You know, do we need, I need to go to the toilet. Always pair it with some sort of picture, whether that be on cough drop or a tangible picture. We like tangible pictures because we can litter the environment. And that means we're going to have that picture available in multiple places in the classroom and in the center. So if you're at home, you can have that picture in your living room, in the kitchen, in their bedroom. So it's always accessible to the child and to you as you're teaching them to go. If you need the same kind of pictures that we have at the center, ask your behavioral specialist and we can get you some laminated copies so you can have them at home too. Requesting the toilet. It often takes children a long time to learn specific terms and words and relearning new words may be challenging in the future. So we prefer to use the terms toilet and bathroom rather than potty. It's also age appropriate as they get older to say, I need the toilet rather than I need to use the potty. Successes. If the child urinates in the toilet, immediately provide the reward. The reward can be be delayed after the child has experienced several successes without accidents. But when you're starting out, have that reward available to them so they can immediately get it. Bring it into the bathroom with you. So as soon as they have a success, you can immediately reward them so they know what they're being rewarded for. Accidents. When your child has an accident, neutrally tell the child you are wet, you need to ask for the bathroom. Your child should be responsible for changing their clothes as independently as possible. On the children who aren't, I kind of like to hook their little thumbs in their pants, wiggle their pants down, or I'll pull their pants down just below their bottoms and have them do the rest, just making sure that they do it as much as they can on their own. Sometimes we get a few kids that are, are tricky and be in the bathroom helping them, and I'm helping them much more than they need it because I'll talk to the teaching staff, and they're like, oh, no, they can do that all by themselves. So you can be in communication with the teaching staff, too, to see what they're doing at the center, how they're doing with those skills, all that stuff. Verbal directions and eye contact should be reduced during this time as providing attention contingent on an accident might potentially become reinforcing for the child. Really be neutral if they're wet. Avoid eye contact. Don't put too much attention on it. Really try to downplay your reactions and conversation with the child during this time. A lot of our kids will have accidents on purpose because then they get a staff one-on-one. They get a staff giving them all that attention in the bathroom. Even if we are neutral, they're still gaining some attention from that. Adjust toileting schedule. Gradually adjust the toileting schedule after several consecutive days of successes without accidents. For example, you might increase from 30 minutes to every hour than every two hours. Yeah, after we see a lot of accidents, we can decrease the amount of time we go to the bathroom. I don't think we often decrease 30 minutes to an hour. We'll usually do 30 minutes to 45 minutes to start out just to see how they do. And then every two hours. For a child who is toilet training, we don't let them go longer than two hours at the center without being taken to the bathroom. We will ask them every hour, but we will take them every two hours just to decrease the chances of an accident and also making sure they know they have access to the bathroom throughout the day. Be patient. Along the way, it might be necessary to modify the steps or rewards. The treatment team will be in contact with caregivers to determine if this is appropriate. When things get frustrating, remember that although this process might be time consuming and messy at times, it is one of the most significant and socially relevant skills that we can teach this child. If you just think about all the things that your child would miss out on or wouldn't have access to, say even as a teenager who's not toilet trained, that can make you feel kind of sad. And we want our children to fit in and have friends and 
we just want them to live the best lives they can live. And toilet training is one of the most important skills that they can have. So if you guys have any questions about toilet training or the process, all the teaching staff does have this PowerPoint, but they also have access to social stories. They have access to visuals. They can help you figure out a good reinforcer, all that stuff. So when you're ready to toilet train or when you think your child might be ready, talk to your child's behavioral specialist or autism specialist and see what they think and see if you could meet to come up with a plan. Thank you.